think um, I think we can start now. I think we have uh, what they call critical mass. Um, so welcome everyone to this uh, lovely webinar uh, for from the Santa Clara County Single Payer Healthcare Coalition. We would like to advise you that we will be recording this event. And also you may notice um, that we are trying out closed captioning run by voice recognition, which is running at the bottom of the screen. If you don't want to be seeing it, press CC in the lower right side of your screen and click on hide subtitles. And um, also, uh, if you are speaking, please try to enunciate because that makes the voice recognition be more effective. Uh, I'm Peggy and I will be your MC. Uh, before we start, please join me in acknowledging today wherever we are in California and across this country, that we live on occupied lands of indigenous people whose suffering has shaped our history and who live among us to this day. Please make a point of learning about your area's indigenous people's past and present. COVID has exacerbated and laid bare the inequities of healthcare in low income areas in Santa Clara County. This especially affects uh, communities of immigrants, people of color, and disabled people. The Santa Clara County Single Payer Healthcare Coalition is hosting this event so that we would have all have an opportunity to share experiences and solutions. We've had a dozen of us working on this that I will acknowledge at the end. We will be hearing from our great grassroots leaders about healthcare issues in their communities. And also, we will have a presentation from the California Nurses Association about Medicare for All and CalCare. There will be a brief message from Ro Khanna and Ash Kalra. We will have some time uh, at the end to answer questions and to talk about upcoming actions, publicized resources, and requests for support, and propose new ways of reaching our communities. You can put comments in the chat and questions in the Q&A but we will not be doing question, uh, the questions until the end. And so um, I'd like to begin with a message from Ro Khanna, Congressional Representative for the 17th Congressional District and Supreme Medicare for All supporter. A member of Ro's staff, Swapanthi Mandalika, will be speaking for Ro. So Great. Swapanthi, you're on. Yes. yes, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Swapanthi Mandalika, and I'm the Director of Constituent Services in Congressman Ro Khanna's office. Unfortunately, the Congressman had prior commitments and could not make this meeting, but if his schedule had allowed, he would have really loved to be a part of this. So thank you so much for organizing this. Um, in any case, I'm so honored to represent him today, and I would like to give a warm welcome to the esteemed panelists and members of the audience. Um, I just wanted to say very briefly that I feel extremely lucky to work for a member of Congress who genuinely, at the core of his heart, believes that healthcare is a human right. It's a fundamental human right, and he's dedicated much of his time in Congress advocating for that right. Um, introducing the State-Based Universal Healthcare Act, for example, is one among the many ways he's fought for attaining this goal. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I think many of us can agree that uh, the need to recognize healthcare as a human right has become all the more pressing. So I wanted to give everyone the message and convey the reassurance that this is a number one priority for the congressman and we are extremely honored to be a part of this initiative. Thank you again for thinking of our office and, and wishing you the very best for today's event. I'm, I'm looking forward to listening. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Swapanthi. Um, and now we're going to start our uh, stream of amazing panelists here. Um, our first one is Brenda Zendejas. Brenda is an educator and a longtime Alamorat community leader with a very big heart. She is the vice chair of the Movimiento Democratic Coalition and on the steering committee of the South Bay Progressive Alliance. She is also secretary of the Silicon Valley Young Democrats and the delegate to the California Democratic Party. Welcome, Brenda. And if you are not speaking, please um, mute yourselves. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank the Single Healthcare Coalition for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Brenda Sendejas. I am a proud mother of two children in the East Side San Jose area. When COVID-19 began, a little movement that prioritized providing financial relief, food to the East Side San Jose families through the generosity and donations of community members, Ellos Tambien was created. Our focus was to help our undocumented families that were left out. Our local farmers, like Farmer's Brother Lunch from Jane Slick um, Farmer's Market partnered with us and we provided fresh organic vegetables to our families. We dropped off essentials and groceries to their doorsteps. I'm so thankful to our partners and community members that jumped in to help our families. I think we're all not aware or we are, we are all aware that COVID-19 not only shined light to the inequities of quality healthcare, but showed us where our two colors where our Latinos stand in the healthcare system. Our Latino population was the most affected in areas like District 5 and 7 in Eastside San Jose. During this, I witnessed how the community suffered and I took notes and started advocating for them wherever I could. As I helped more and more families, I noticed it was more than just resources that our family need. It was language, interpretation, transportation, education, financial assistance, and healthcare. There are so many barriers why many choose not to call an ambulance, see a doctor, or get tested. There are fears of deportation, financial burden, lack of information or a postal address to use. We have families who rent rooms, garage or studios, and they don't know that they can still get medical attention regardless of their current living situation. They're unaware of who to call or where to go to, to receive COVID-19 help or healthcare information. Our Latinos predominantly use each other for information, neighbors, family, or a trusted person. In this case, I was a to-go person for so many families. We have families who didn't know where to find their loved ones that passed away in the hospital during COVID-19. We need to do better. Latinos have received 15% of nearly 5 million COVID-19 vaccine doses in California. Latinos have made up a bulk of infections and deaths here. People in communities of color are receiving the vaccine at a lower rate. This has to change. We need to educate and reach our most vulnerable population. We need healthcare for all. Healthcare is a human right. I wanna thank everyone who has organized, advocated and fought for healthcare for all. I wanna thank assembly member Ashkarla for being the author of the Cut Care Act and Congre Congressman Ro Khanna for endorsing it, and assembly members like Alex Lee. This is the solution we need. We need healthcare for all to ensure that everyone gets equitable healthcare. I wanna thank everyone for being here today. And I wanna thank the Single Healthcare Coalition Act for putting up a good fight and making sure that we are heard and we are loud and we are noticed because healthcare is a human right. Thank you. Peggy, you're on mute. Peggy, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, apologies. Um, thank you so much, Brenda, for that heartfelt uh, presentation. Now we're gonna move on to Hui Tran. Hui is a member of the Vietnamese American Roundtable, a steering committee member of the Santa Clara County Wage Theft Coalition, an appointed member of the Housing and Community Development Commission for the City of San Jose from 2017 to 2019, and a partner with Justice at Work Law Group that focuses on social justice and workers' rights. 
Thank you so much, Hui, for, for joining us. You're on. Thank you very much, Peggy. And it's great to see everyone here gather around for such an important cause. Uh, I am going to share a screen here. Um, oh, actually, uh, would, uh, would the host be able to enable screen sharing for me? Uh, we wanted to present today, you know, to talk about the health concerns of Vietnamese Americans. Uh, and, you know, the good thing is we, we, we have some past data to rely on so that we can get a better glimpse of the struggles of Vietnamese Americans. Um, however, this information does not come in in a way that allows us to stay active and actively aware of the issues that arise and the issues that we deal with because oftentimes data uh, for the API community is all lumped together and we don't actually get an accurate, uh, an accurate portrayal of the struggles and, and the challenges uh, that, the, uh, that our communities, that our respective communities present. So give me a quick second here as you're I- now, You're now a co-host, we. Oh. Uh, and so you should be able to share your screen. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, I am going to get this started. There we are. Okay. Excuse me here, Wen, while I get this shared. Okay. Now, uh, are you able to see the presentation? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So the information that I want to provide to you all today here uh, is really focused on the, the Vietnamese American community and the sources of this data really come from one study that was conducted in 2011. It's the Vietnamese American uh, uh, health assessment. Uh, just quickly about me, I was going to introduce myself, but Peggy did a great job. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to go here, just provide some basic information about demographics, and then talk about the health assessment and how COVID-19 has really impacted the Vietnamese community, right? Now, there are 140,000 Vietnamese people in Santa Clara County. That makes Santa Clara County home to the second largest Vietnamese population in one county outside of Vietnam. It is the third most spoken language here aside from English. Now, in, in the 2011 Vietnamese Health Survey, uh, the health assessment, there were some really dramatic conclusions that were showed there. One in 10 Vietnamese families lives in poverty. 69% of our population here is born in Vietnam and 79% of those born in, uh, in Vietnam who came here are naturalized citizens now. And the three largest concerns for Vietnamese Americans are health insurance and access to healthcare, mental health and cancer uh, related screenings and cancer treatments. If you, and we're also, you also find that based on our demographics, we're heavily uh, concentrated in the eastern part of Santa Clara County. Now, I want to point that out here, right? If we look at this map here, we, there is a spread that ranges all the way from Milpitas all the way down to, uh, to the Evergreen area. Uh, but our the concentration of Vietnamese families is actually in zip code 95122, which uh, based on the uh, based on more recent articles, it's, it's the the hardest hit zip code in San Jose in Santa Clara County. This is the area that's between Kelly Park and the Reed Hill View Airport in East Side. Now it is the hardest hit, and of course, uh, you know we share in those struggles and we share in the impacts as well with the uh, with the communities who share in that uh, neighborhood. Now, the determinants here, the social determinants of healthcare, are very dramatic here. And now the reason why I want to break this down is because disaggregation is a major, major need for the Vietnamese American community. Uh, the average income level based on 2007 to 2009 data is $72,358 in median household income. Generally speaking, APIs are considered the wealthiest uh, households here at over $100,000 in median income. But once we separate out the data, once we break it down by community, these median lowest income- One minute. Vietnamese median American income is actually the lowest among APIs uh, and, and only uh, only above those uh, from households from the black community and the brown community. Now we can't we're not here to we cannot deny at all that the black and brown communities have been hit heavily by COVID-19 and hit heavily by, by the social determinants that have created this disparity that we see all throughout our healthcare system. Um, 
And the thing, the thing is, though, is that we have to really be able to break down API data to see where Southeast Asian families, where South Asian families or East Asian families are struggling as well. And that has not been happening except for snippets of information. In fact, what I'm presenting to you now is 2007 to 2009 data, right? We won't be able to, get, we won't be able to see much more recent data for a while. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here quickly. We can even talk about housing. When we talk about housing, um, over 59% of Vietnamese homeowners spend more than 30% of their household income on mortgages and other home ownership expenses. 54% of Vietnamese renters spend more than 30% of their household income on rent. This is a picture that is painted very differently from what we often hear about APIs, that we struggle less, uh, you know, that we're, you know, we're the model minority, we've got it figured out. Right. And the truth of the matter is, is that when you roll everyone together, you miss a lot of the stories and the nuances uh, that are very important to understanding what our struggles are. Now, uh, in the same assessment, we found out that 26 percent of Vietnamese adults do not have health insurance. Now, this is before the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, and the same data set also showed that 16 percent of Vietnamese adults could not see a doctor when needed uh, because of costs. And that be, is one of the big, uh, other biggest needs too, um, and justifications in my view of why we need a single payer healthcare system that ensures everybody gets access to quality healthcare that can treat some of the biggest concerns for our health uh, to take care of ourselves and our families. For Vietnamese households, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension are of particular concern and some of the issues that we deal with most uh, regularly. And I want to be able to hit this really hard here, right? Um, besides just the push for single uh, for, for single payer healthcare, the one thing that we need to know is just data. We need to understand what our struggles are, and that's the kind of information that we don't get right now because all of our stories are rolled into one. And the assumption, based on what we have right now, is that we're doing okay. The one time Santa Clara County started disaggregating data for uh, among the API communities for co uh, for its COVID nineteen dashboard showed that, uh, one make it very clear, that black and brown communities are suffered uh, harshly. But when you look at just the API data, like all rolled together, there was an assumption that API folks were doing just fine. When you break it apart, we find that the Vietnamese and the Filipino communities have been overhit dramatically hard when we compare it to all of the API communities. And the difference is very staggering. And yet, this is not a practice that continues. This is not something that is being still being done. Now, there's a, aside from our physical health, of course, we're concerned about our mental health and CEREC, that's the Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia Resource and uh, Action Council, will be releasing a, a report next month to focus on our mental health needs as well. It's coming out, so I can't give you more, share too much information, but VAR is very proud to be a part of that program. Uh, and wanted to share more about why we need to focus on healthcare, a strong healthcare for the Vietnamese communities as, as well, and uh, healthcare that provides support for all of us. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hui. Um, that's precisely why we uh, wanted to have um, the representatives of the Vietnamese and Filipino communities um, separately represented and not lumped lump together. So thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to go on to Kiana Simmons. Kiana is the president, CEO, and founder of uh, Hero Tent and Hero is, uh, stands for Human Empowerment Radical Optimism. Hero Tent is sustaining those who are fighting for social justice and systemic change and taking care of our neighbors who need help. So Kiana, you're on. Hello everyone, my name is Kiana. I am a little nervous, so if I mess up a little bit, please forgive me, but I did prepare something to say, so I'm just going to dive right into that. Healthcare is one of the most important things to members in our community, and yet it is inaccessible to many. The United States healthcare system is plagued with inequalities. Healthcare in this country directly intersects with civil rights for African Americans, for Indigenous peoples, Chicano Latinx people, and unhoused people. The long history of healthcare suppression starts with the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. The recently freed slaves were dying in high numbers because disease was spreading through the community. Most of the newly freed had nowhere to go and were living on the streets with little access to basic personal hygiene. In hopes of preventing spread of disease to white communities, the federal government established the Freedmen's Bureau Medical Division in 1865. 
this was our country's first and only experience with public health care. Oh, sorry, not only, um, but an organization that was founded by federal by the federal government for the newly emancipated slaves. Sadly, it did not last long because of racism and white supremacy, which our communities are still facing today. One of the biggest talking points in opposition at the time was that creating a system where undeserving people had access to government funded support systems would make those people, meaning black people at the time, reliant on those institutions. And th doesn't that argument sound familiar? In 2021, the same logic is being used to argue against universal health care. The talking points can be traced back directly to white supremacy and institutionalized su systemic oppression of black people in this country. And black people are still suffering to this day. Just take the ongoing pandemic. And I really wanna tap into what Brenda was saying here. Brenda, thank you for all of your input here. The COVID-19 crisis highlights just how large the healthcare gap is and showcases the disproportionate effects it has on communities of color. Indigenous people are hospitalized at a rate four times higher than white people. African-Americans are dying at three times the rate of white people. But oddly enough, the vac vaccination rate among white people is over three times higher than the rate for Latinx people, 10% versus 3%, and it's twice as high as the rate for black people, 10% versus 5%. White people have a higher vaccination rate compared to Latinx and black people in all reporting states, despite having a lower rate of hospitalizations and deaths. So when we come together and fight for healthcare for all, it is important to recognize that many black, indigenous, Latinx people do not have equal access to health insurance and there is a long history of this country systemically oppressing minorities. And I stand with support uh, for AB 1400 because it is the first step to comprehensive coverage for everyone, regardless of income, employment, age, and race. And thank you everyone for having me be here. I am done with my little spiel. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kiana. That was wonderful and very uh, factual. So um, now we, were, we will be moving on to Christine Fitzgerald. Christine is on staff as a community advocate for the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, as well as being a past board member and vice president. She has also done trainings for students with disabilities, facilitated support groups, and given presentations to health policy classes. So, Christine, it's all yours. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, I just wanted to make sure I turn that on. All right, so um, having a single payer system would make it so much easier for many people with disabilities to receive needed health care services, especially during the, the pandemic. So let's take a look at what's happening currently with folks with disabilities because of the pandemic. Right now, um, because of a lot of work that's been done through the city and county, uh, we've made sure that uh, testing sites and soon, well, now, <laughs> vaccine sites are fully accessible um, to both walk up and roll up in cars or vans um, or they're in place. Um, uh -huh. We're also having a little bit of a challenge to try and get uh, parent transit to work with us, but we're still fighting for that. We also want to make sure that those who are receiving uh, Medi-Cal and therefore IHSS in-home supportive services get vaccinated, not only for the service providers, but the employers slash um, recipients of the IHSS services as well. This way, um, that household is better protected. <clears throat> Now coming in March, on March 15th, Governor, Governor Gavin Newsom has set forth that uh, some people with disabilities who have a higher priority 
folks who, for example, may have cancer, who may have pulmonary or respiratory uh, disabilities, uh, people who are uh, autistic or who may have Down syndrome, um, will have a, a higher rating in the system and will therefore be able to get uh, vaccinated sooner. This covers folks from the ages of 15 to about 64. It makes it a lot easier for folks uh, to um, get better health care. But we also need to remember that uh, not only is COVID uh, affecting how we receive health care, uh, um, either <clears throat> getting tested for or the vaccine for COVID, but it's also affecting housing as well. Because <clears throat> and the inability to work due to uh, shelter in place, folks are encountering um, more difficulty in paying either rents or mortgages. We've had a moratorium here in the county that has, that has been renewed several times over and will continue to be renewed until such time as we uh, are truly out of it, hopefully sooner rather than later. We also need to remember that as has been said prior, COVID is affecting people of color far more often in the black and brown communities. One minute. And these wonderful folk are often healthcare providers, the in-home support service representative and providers. We need to protect folks who are helping so many people and need to ensure that people can get vaccinated um, more than sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christine. And I love your golden gate in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, uh, next, we have Felwina Opiso Mondina. She is a member of the uh, Filipino Association of Workers and Immigrants, PAWIS. Felwina works with Filipinos, primarily caregivers working in residential care facilities and nursing assisted living facilities who have wage theft and immigration issues. In addition, she participates in the Employment Law Clinic of the Catherine and George Alexander Law Center and is part of the Santa Clara County Office of Labor Standards Enforcement Advice Line. Welcome, Felwina. Thank you. Um, magandang hapon. Good afternoon. I'm Felwina Opiso Mundina, and I am with the Philippine Association of Workers and Immigrants, or PAWIS. I would like to thank the organizers of this event for giving me this opportunity to bring into the conversation the perspective of the caregivers, the low-wage earners in the healthcare industry. Direct care workers are paid considerably lower than the median average for U.S. workers in the private sector. One in four direct care workers live below the federal poverty level, and nearly half of all direct care workers live in households that receive one or more public benefits such as food stamps and Medicaid. As many of you may have known, majority of the members of our organization are caregivers who are victims of wage theft, and some of them are also victims of labor trafficking. They work in assisted living and nursing facilities in six beds or the RCFEs, and they are also employed by healthcare agencies. They endure poor working conditions, particularly live-in caregivers working in small RCFEs who are working 24-7 are just paid a flat daily or monthly rate without accounting for hours work or minimum wage or overtime rules. Many caregivers often work round the clock without proper pay, adequate sleeping facilities, or sufficient sleep. 
frequently, small RCFEs do not keep records or keep inaccurate or false records of hours worked. Misclassification of workers as independent contractors and retaliation is prevalent. Many caregivers are already in their 40s and 50s with underlying conditions and are at high risk of contracting COVID-19. However, in my conversations with our members and contacts, Obtaining a health insurance is not a priority. For one, their income is barely enough for their basic necessities in order to survive living in our county. Also, their main priority in working here in the U.S. is to be able to continually and regularly send money back to the Philippines in order for their families and relatives to survive. In the Philippines, if a family member is working in the U.S., at least there is the assurance that they will not go hungry, that there will be money to build a house, clothe the kids, and send them to school. Many of the Powys members I know are so self-sacrificing. Factoring in wage theft, expenses for basic necessities, and regular remittances to their, to their families, they just have enough left for rent or transportation, and no more money to buy health insurance. It is ironic that caregivers who provide care for the old and the most vulnerable in the American society are the most vulnerable to sickness and death, especially now in the time of the pandemic. Moreover, undocumented caregivers are not eligible to buy marketplace health coverage. While our county hospitals provide emergency care regardless of immigration status, but still it is only during emergency. We want our caregivers to avail of a comprehensive health care so that they are confident that they are safe and healthy as they continue to provide care to our community. In this time of the pandemic, the caregivers are actually the unseen and unsung heroes toiling for low pay, risking their lives as they continue to care for clients in nursing homes and facilities with COVID positive patients. That's why on behalf of BAWIS, I wholeheartedly support AB1400 or the Guaranteed Health Care for All, introduced by Assembly Members Ash Kalra and Alex Lee. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Felwina. We're certainly glad you, you could be here to speak us on this important issue of uh, healthcare workers. Um, our next uh, panelist is Ruth McKinney. Ruth is a founding mother of the Low Income Self-Help Center and on the board of directors. She started out working as a nurse's aide at a convalescent home while she was still in high school. She worked at Kaiser Santa Clara for over 15 years. She has facilitated support groups and been a suicide uh, hotline volunteer and also served as education coordinator, setting up 12 week training programs for new volunteers. She also puts her technical craft and sewing skills at the service of others. So welcome, Ruth. Ruth? All right, I had trouble at beauty myself. Hi. Um, I want to thank you uh, for asking me to be a part of this. And I want to thank you to all of my fellow panelists spoken before me. One thing I want to say is because of our current profit over health care, patients are not getting the care and health that they need. Nursing staff has been stretched and overworked beyond their belief. I would like to talk a little bit about what I've seen over the years with my parents and especially my mother with multiple hospital patients. I have seen the need for patient advocacy. I spoke up to the nursing and doctor staff when questions needed to be asked. I would help out the staff as much as I could, whether it was to go find a warm blanket or get some more. They didn't have to do that. On those few days that I didn't live at the hospital 24 7, I would ask the nursing staff to contact the doctor uh, to come back because I had questions to ask him. When I did that, I noticed that doctors seemed to pay more attention to what their patients needed. And that's really sad that 
there has to be somebody there to do that. Yet, I know because of our current health care system, profit over health, that's what's happened. As a result, I became a fierce advocate and stepped in to speak to, to uh, whatever I could to help. I have been, uh, I have worked both as a nursing staff and watched them as both the nursing staff and the patients have struggled. I've wondered what happened to those who do not have the uh, advocacy or somebody to advocate for them. Several years ago, before the COVID pandemic, after my neck surgery, I was transferred to rehab for six for six weeks. Say, suddenly I was the one who needed an advocate. Personally, I don't know what I would have done without my uh, without Catherine, my roommate and sister, who became my advocate. She hunted down PT departments and made sure that I was seen that day. She spent eight hours a day to help or speak up for me. She came to the weekly patient care conferences to speak and help support me so that there were not eight staff members against one. They told me if I wasn't improving the piece with PT or if I didn't work hard enough, I would be discharged. It didn't matter whether or not I had all the necessary skills. Again, the bottom line with our current healthcare system is that they want to get patients discharged as soon as they can without patients being strong enough because of the profit over health. Now, just to jump ahead, um, I would like to talk about my mother who was hospitalized during the beginning of the uh, COVID pandemic. She was rushed to Good Sam and needed to be hospitalized and was transferred to rehab. The nursing staff did as much as they could. Um, they uh, were overworked, again, overworked and underpaid and stretched beyond their belief. Often the nursing staff had to go home to be with their families or they lived in a hotel to keep their families safe from the pandemic. One minute. My mother, just as a note, my mother was a Medi-Cal uh, Medicare patient. I was told by the administrator at the beginning they didn't have any long-term care beds available. It took fierce advocacy and relationship building to keep her there. Once it became clear that my mother needed long-term care, despite the fact that she became a hospice patient, they were going to transfer her to another facility because they didn't have any long-term care beds available. I found this out because one night when I was dropping off her um, sheriff calls check, the administrator came up to me. It was eight o'clock at night and told me that they had a place that was they were going to accept her. The next day, she tested positive for COVID, the day after Christmas, and she passed away two days later. And I'm, I'm done. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's so important to have these personal stories um, about what our for-profit health care program is doing for us. Um, next, we have Sitlalmina Ortiz, uh, also known as Maria Ortiz. She has been involved in the Rasa Community Defense Projects and Organizations since the 70s around issues of cell defense self-determination um, self for La Raza in regards to immigrants, prisons, police brutality, housing, and schools. She has been involved in various coalitions under the Barrio Defense Committee, one of which is the COVID-19 Action Network. She is currently involved in building Raza community centers such as the Central Asitlan, Chico Mostoc, and other nonprofit organizations. Welcome, Seat Lalmina. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Greetings to all present, in particular those that organize this very important conference. On behalf of the COVID-19 Action Network, we wish to thank you for allowing us this space to speak about our contribution to combat the COVID-19. Secondly, we wish to honor 
and give homage to all those beloved peoples who fell victims of this worldwide pandemic, specifically all those men, women, and children in Santa Clara County, the Bay Area, and in California. The COVID-19 Action Network began in May 2020 when various organizations came together, such as the Barrio Defense Committee, Peace and Justice Center, uh, California Nurses Association, local 2015 home care workers, retired nurse and activist Greg Miller, Anak Bayan, Five for 15 PLS, Change San Jose, and now we are privileged and honored to have organizers from Redwood City and Half Moon Bay in San Mateo County. To address the increasing people in our communities that were being infected by COVID-19 and questioning the city and county authorities of their slow pace in coming up with a strategy in the protection and prevention of our communities. We address the issue of very few testing sites and very little information given to the communities to protect ourselves. We organized a press conference in June when the nurses were striking the regional medical center in East San Jose due to the closing of the maternity ward at the RMC and the lack of PPEs to the nurses. The press conference was held at the East Side Medical Clinic on McKee calling for eight demands. The demands were sent to the city and county officials. Because of the lack of information from the city and county officials, we produced three informative posters in Spanish to self-protect ourselves and distributed them in commercial areas where people shopped in primarily the east side. In October, the coalition held another press conference regarding the same demands due to the high mortality rate in the Chicano Mexicano Latino community. In November, the president of the County Board of Supervisors met with the coalition members and we addressed our concerns of which the president was to follow up on. A letter was sent to the County Board of Supervisors on February 2nd of 2021, requesting her follow up and to date has not responded. Currently, we will also be meeting on March 5th with the Mexican Council General to approach mutual collaboration in terms of the protection and prevention of the Mexican people living in, in Santa Clara County. If, every, if anyone is interested in that, please let us know. To date, some of the demands have been answered, but not fully. Herewith are the demands and as you can see, this is the, these are the posters. Number one, more information on the awareness of COVID-19 and the importance of protection to the community in Spanish and other languages, such as flyers, billboards, and posters with continuous reporting on the progression of the COVID-19. We must also have community education led by the community in languages where COVID-19 has penetrated the most. Mobile vans must be provided throughout the affected zones. Mm -hmm. Two, continuous reporting on the state of elders and what is being done to protect them as it is the highest percentage of infected and deaths. Three, that public institutions such as a fire department, ambulance and community organizations provide and distribute face masks to the people or fund community organizations to, to buy face masks for distribution. Four, One minute. need to have community clinics conduct testing, testing instead of private companies and corporations. Five, need to have more testing sites and a method of signing up to get tested, such as uh, walk, walk up testing. Six, the regional medical center owned by Hospital Corporation of America must not be allowed to close its obstetrics, prenatal, maternity, and neonatal care facilities. Contrary to regional medical centers claims that there are not enough births to justify keeping the maternity ward open, vital statistics show that there is a higher than average birth rate uh, included in the Mexican Chicano Latino community on San Jose's east side. 
and RMC is the only hospital serving that area. Regional Medical Center's suggestion that birthing mothers can instead go to Good Samaritan Hospital makes no sense because it is 15 miles away. No other hospital is close to the east side. Seven, need to open up hotels for the homeless immediately. Santa Clara County has failed in utilizing funds. The governor and uh, the population has, uh, has distributed to these uh, needs. Eight, rents must be canceled and shelters must be put in place. And now nine, vaccines must be accessible to all and to be totally free to all. So as you can see, those are the posters that we have been distributing in the east side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, The Those posters are wonderful. And I've seen them around and I wondered, I wonder who did those. <laughs> so um, next we have James Statton. James is chair of the Silicon Valley NAACP Healthcare Committee. He holds a master's uh, of education degree and is a high school science teacher. He is also past chair of the NAACP's Youth Leadership Forum. Welcome, James. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, a lot of the things I was going to say have already been said by a lot of different people, but I'm going to go through it anyway. Uh, this pandemic has really illustrated what is wrong with the health healthcare in this country. It's unequal. Access to it is unequal. Treatment is unequal. And all this pushback we get about socialism, because we want to pay, you know, make sure every person within our borders is able to access health care and get quality health care is nonsense. You know, our slogan to the last year has been, we are done dying. The this this pandemic hit our communities hard. We were already suffering. You know, and like someone has said several times, your zip code determine your healthcare outcomes and your education. You know, when this pandemic first hit, all the media covered was the rich, rich white people who were dying for it. They've gone overseas and they've come back and they died. Or they were older and they were dying. They ignored the fact that even though we're only 13% of the population, 30 to 50% of the people dying in Louisiana, in North Carolina, in New York, in Detroit, were, were Black or Latino or Pacific Islander. And so it was given the uh, perception out there it was a rich white person's disease. You know, the same thing we went through with AIDS. Uh, and so people are out there, they continue with their lives like nothing was going on. And so they were dying. And now the misinformation out there still about testing, about the vaccines. We've got two, two I think they're about to approve a third vaccine and the nonsense they're putting out there is crazy. It's not gonna rewrite your DNA. It's not gonna make you sterile. Yes, you know, there's gonna be a few side effects but that's your body's natural reaction to a foreign substance. Vaccination rates, are way lower for black people, Latino people, and other, other people of color because of the, this country's past behavior. Everyone knows about the Tuskegee experiment where you know, they purposely gave these black men syphilis and withheld the treatments to see what would happen. You know, everyone knows about the forced sterilization of black and brown and poor people, women, you know, you know when they went in for other things, but he sterilized them at the same time. Everyone knows about the higher death rate, the maternity, maternal death rates among black and brown people. But a lot of people have the attitude, well, it's not happened to us, so it's not really that important. That's why you know, we're very concerned. And also during this pandemic, we had to push to get the, the, the data on how it was affecting the different groups in this country. You know, originally they didn't want to give it out because they didn't want to make themselves look bad. They didn't want to let people know that, you know, you know, people were dying. On the east side of San Jose, 
the, play, the hardest hit part, they weren't talking about it. Just like they weren't doing testing originally over there. And it's like now with the vaccines, they weren't originally distributing equal quantities of the vaccine on that side. We've had to push for that. Our group, La Raza, all these other, the Filipino group, all these other groups had to push to get them to talk about it. And we're mm-hmm. talking about the unequal distribution of the vaccine. Well, why is it people on the west side don't seem to have a shortage? The people on the east side seem to have a shortage of uh, vaccine available. One minute. Okay. So, and why is, you know, the, they, they're showing their privilege. You saw what happened with Good Samaritan and the Los Gatos, you know, teachers. I'm a teacher. I realize we need to be up there high, but having them lie about who they are to get the uh, vaccine was ridiculous. So I'm, I thank you for having me here. I don't want to go over my time. And, you know, oh, one last thing, you know, we have talked about how this is mentally affecting our, our, our um, communities. You know, contrary to what some um, racist anti-American people say, the black family is important. You know, the Latino family is important. And not being able to be there when our people are dying in the hospital is, is taking a toll. Heck, I'm going through it myself. My stepmother just died. My brother and her both went in the hospital with COVID. He came home. She didn't. He is falling apart in Southern California. So <laughs> this, you know, this we've got to get this under control. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Thank you so, so much. Um, our final speaker is Mary Jesse Celestine. Mary Jesse is founder of San Jose Strong, and she's a senior engineering major at Harvey Mudd College. And she's currently interning uh, at an additive manufacturing engineering startup in a Smart Cities podcast team. Her hobbies include being a musician, fantasy author, and a STEM curriculum developer and teacher. Welcome, Mary Jesse Celestine. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Mary Jesse Celestine and I'm here to talk to you guys. And I'm going to drop in some links for you before I get started. So the first link is um, the, the speech that I'm going to be speaking and it includes all of my text. So if someone prefers to read it instead of just listening to me, you have that as well. And a website that I will explain at the end. When I think of health justice, there are so many topics and themes that come to mind. We don't have a lot of time though, so I'm going to talk about just one topic, Black women and racial disparities in healthcare, with an emphasis on healthcare for cancer patients. But before I dive into these disparities with some startling statistics, I want to highlight a brilliant doctor in the field of cancer treatment, Jane C. Wright. Born in 1919, Dr. Wright came from a long line of doctors. Her grandfather was a graduate of the first medical school for African-Americans in the American South. Her father was one of the first black graduates of Harvard Medical School and her sister would also become a doctor. Wright grew up to continue this legacy and revolutionize cancer treatment. She was the genius behind modern day chemotherapy by being one of the first doctors to one, conduct clinical trials and directly work with patients, two, invent numerous new non-surgical techniques to distribute chemotherapy through the bloodstream, and three, analyze live tissue cultures in her research. All the while, Wright became the highest ranked African-American woman in higher education as an associate dean and professor at New York Medical College. She was also the first woman president of the New York Cancer Society. Wright's contributions to cancer research are revolutionary, but as a black woman, her story is the exception, not the rule which leads me to the rules, or rather the the statistics of today. First, only 2% of US physicians are black women. Secondly, only 1.5% of submitted NIH grant applications to conduct scientific research come from black applicants. Amongst those applicants, roughly one in 10 will receive funding compared to one in six for their white counterparts. The disparities in how much these scientists are funded is even greater with up to a 10 point percentage difference between black scientists and any other demographic. And finally, black women are underrepresented in clinical trials and genetic databases. Data from the FDA shows that in trials for 24 of the 31 cancer drugs approved since 2015, less than 5% of participants were black. 
In order to receive adequate health care, one must see themselves and their needs represented in medical professionals, in scientific research topics, and in research participants and databases. With greater representation in these three black branches, black women would not be three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. Fibroids research, which is recognized as a common Ill illness impacting si roughly 60% of black women over the age of 35, would receive more funding, not the mere 17 million per year it receives today. For comparison, cystic fibrosis, which is recognized as a rare illness that primarily impacts the white population, receives roughly $86 million a year from the NA from NIH funding. The lives of Black women truly hang in the balance due to the inadequacies in our healthcare system. I am personally pass passionate about this subject because my mom, a Black woman, was diagnosed with stage 3C ovarian cancer when I was nine. She'd spent several years knowing that something was wrong, struggling with fibroids, and pushing doctors to find the root cause. Upon diagnosis, she participated in an experimental trial, and despite only a 20% chance of survival, is now a statistical survivor. I see the legacy of Dr. Wright's work in my mom's survival and hope for a future when the rule book has changed and Dr. Wright is no longer an exception to the rule, but rather a standard in the medical field. That is why I'm encouraging you all today to check out the Black Women's Health Imperative, the only national nonprofit dedicated solely to the healthness, health and wellness of Black women and girls and has been around for um, years. Please give this organization a follow and donate if you can. I have dropped their website along with the script and work cited for this speech in the Zoom chat. Thank you all for your time and it is an honor to speak with you today. Thank you, everyone. Oh, wow, thank you. Thank you for such an inf uh, informational presentation. I learned a lot in five minutes. <laughs> so um, I'm so impressed with all of our panelists. We're gonna be moving on to another segment of our program today. We're going to work, uh, move on to a um, a, uh, a solution. <laughs> uh, the solution, uh, Mari Lopez is an organizer for the California Nurses Association. She heads up the Spanish texting team and also has begun doing, along with other staff members, presentations in Spanish on Medicare para todos. Um, she's going to be talking about um, Medicare for all and um, she will, she'll be giving a, a short presentation, although it's 15 minutes, it's longer than other folks, but it's uh, what's needed in order to explain what this is. That's kind of a short introduction for Mari, so I'll let her ask more, ask, uh, add more if she would like to about herself. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, Peg, and thank you, Greg, for the invitation. Thanks to all of you for being here this afternoon. I'm actually gonna focus uh, on uh, the bill that was just released and talk a little bit about Medicare for All as well, and uh, and just also reflects the reason why we need uh, uh, single pair right now, but all of you obviously know why. But, uh, and as uh, some of the speakers already mentioned, you know, COVID has laid bare as to why we do need to change our healthcare system. Uh, if I may, I'd like to share my screen. I think I'm able to now. Let's see. Yes, here we go. All right. All right, let me put in presenters mode. Fantastic. Let me move all this so you guys don't see all of us. All right, wonderful. So I have quite a few um, slides to go through, so I'm going to try to do it in 15 minutes as quickly as possible. So as you know, and thank you to one of the, the, the esteemed guests on your panel this afternoon, uh, you know, we have a bill uh, for AB 1400 that will go a little bit over uh, later on, but uh, from our assembly member, uh, Ash Kara, who's on today and is going to speak with you. Uh, and as you all know, you know, this is a this is something that the California nurses have been fighting for for quite a long time, alongside with all of you. Uh, this is very similar to the principles that we've been looking for, uh, that we seek in all our single payer uh, legislation, whether it be at a federal or state level, which includes uh, nobody, everybody in, nobody out, right? Regardless of of, of uh, any any uh, 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 any uh, what's it. Uh, Sorry, whatever medical condition, immigration staff, or income that you have, you would be included. And again, uh, we also know that this this is a really comprehensive uh, plan, uh, or or, in, or any any legislation that we have can say can. Um, uh, contains uh, comprehensive medical services, and of course, no insurance means elimination of copays, deductibles, and premiums. 
Uh, so these are really some of the highlights of the principle uh, of, of uh, CalCare, what we sought that uh, generously Assemblymember Kara has provided, which is again, universal coverage. I'm not gonna run through all of this again, because I do have 15 minutes. Let me see if I can move this here so you guys can all see that. Um, so uh, yes, really quickly. Okay, and so uh, again, we do have a bill, AB 1400. Uh, again, we're very, very excited. We've been celebrating uh, since this was was uh, introduced last Saturday, last Friday, and so along with all of you, I'm sure we've got wonderful co uh, um, co authors. Uh, you know, of course, the principal authors is uh, Assemblymember uh, Kara along with Alex Lee and, and Miguel Santiago. So we have a, lots of folks on uh, this time around uh, compared to SB 562. And so we're really excited about, uh, about this bill and introduce C and, and the work that we're gonna, I'm gonna share with you about what we're gonna do behind it. So um, again, this is sponsored by CNA and again, we comp uh, provide comprehensive high quality health care for all Californians as a human right. This is really important again, you know, in light of COVID, what we've been seeing, and again, some of these statistics that some of my uh, the previous colleagues have shared with you all, you know, uh, this has really laid bare the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic as to why we need to change our system. The systemic racism that exists in healthcare uh, would start to begin uh, being addressed by a program like single payer. So, um, you know, our system has, um, uh, close that real quick. Our system is really failing us, as you all know. 22.7 million people are uh, pre COVID were uninsured, and 12 million people were uninsured. It means lots of folks have insurance, but they, they hesitate going to the doctor because they can't afford the copays and deductibles. Or, you know, if the doctor does find something, then you know, they're going to be saddled with a high, with a, with a, uh, high um, a medical bill. And so a lot of folks try to just avoid going. They, they're they're uh, meeting the requirement to carry insurance. And so um, a lot of them are, get, are paying for something that they, they, they don't use. Uh, we pay more per capita than any other major country. You've all probably heard this. I'm going to show you a slide really quickly in a bit, minute about this. And then, uh, of course, where the medical medical debt is the number one reason for bankruptcy. Uh, and of, of course, our system return it gives us a return to lower life expectancy, higher infant maternal mortality rates, higher uh, rates of chronic illnesses compared to other countries. And so, this slide really again, this is this is a, this is a, I think this is from 2017 as well. So this slide still is a little bit older, and I'm sure the and of course these number or 2018, sorry. And so these numbers are going to be changed a bit uh, when we update them. So as you can see, uh, per capita person, we're paying ten thousand compared to other countries. Who most of these countries, I think, with the exception of one or two, have single payer systems. So they're actually um, providing healthcare to guaranteeing healthcare to all of their population, and they're paying paying in some cases, you know, uh, half than what we're paying, and in some cases, you know. Um, Jesus, you know, like 95% less than we are. So, you know, we're throwing a lot of money into the system. We're not getting, uh, you know, um, any uh, much bang for our buck. And again, a lot of folks are still uninsured or who, if they have insurance, they can't afford to use it. Uh, medical car, uh, uh, medical, Medicare for all costs less, as you all know. Um, you know, there's been uh, countless studies of, regarding this. You know, we can, there's so many ways that we can go about reducing the cost of, of providing care for everyone. Uh, you know, if we eliminate and streamline the, uh, the cost that we're currently paying now, we could really, uh, we, again, we could save so much, uh, you know, through our federal and state budgets, as well as individual households saving as well. As, you know, one of the things I want to highlight in this slide is, you know, right now our system is costing us $3.6 trillion a year. Medicare for all would cost $2.9 trillion a year. Uh, and again, you know, this is one of the things that we often hear is that how we're going to pay for it. You know, we're already paying for it. Right now, but we're just not getting that guaranteed care because we're paying more for uh, for the few people who have insurance, uh, or you know, for folks who not, for a population that we're not everyone is guaranteed health care. You know, where we could be paying much less for it and have every and everyone get the care that they need. And this is one of the reasons why we are, uh, you know, that uh, the numbers are what they are. As you can see, you know, it's, the salaries are outrageous. And this is just health insurance CEOs. You know, right there is like a billion dollars uh, in, in, uh, that could go into our healthcare system uh, and provide guaranteed healthcare for all. And if you think this is shocking, look at these numbers. Again, this is another, there's a trillion dollars right here alone um, that uh, a lot of folks are, uh, are, um, 
are gouging the system, are using as a means of gouging the system. And, uh, you know, one of these things I always notice when I look at these slides is like there's, uh, there's such a lack of diversity. <laughs> you know, we were, you know, the, Peggy was talking a lot about how, you know, the, the, um, the wall of uh, the Zoom um, uh, photos look great because of the diversity. And here it's not the same thing. So, and there's only one female and one person of color on this slide. So really interesting. But again, this is just to reflect how much money is in the system that exists there. And we're not actually uh, um, investing it in, uh, in providing care for people. Uh, folks have talked about, well, how are you going to pay for it? You know, I just showed you, you know, one way to really eliminate those costly salaries, but also, you know, what we're talking about, and, and this is, and I'm sharing this, folks, because uh, uh, because we're going to get this question a lot, but this is not the way we're going to do it. This, I, well, I should say, these are some of the methods that have been studied in the past as a means for paying for it, right? This is by no means uh, uh, what we're suggesting that could be uh, a means for paying for it. But uh, studies that have looked into these uh, op these these components and these um, these opportunities to uh, answer that question: Where is the money? How do we get it? Or how will we get it for uh, to pay for the system? So um, you know we, we so as I said, we're the financing is is going to be researched. You know it's a different economy right now. Uh, things are always changing. The costs are going up. They're moving around, and so you know uh, I think your financial studies always need to be updated. You know, we're looking at final uh, alternative, uh, not us, but you know, the, the some studies that are out there looking at into alternative financing sources. And uh, we are also want to learn from other systems, right? Because every system is different. And, you know, you hear often that, well, you know, Canada this or UK that or, you know, whatever country that they want to compare the U.S. to. When we talk about getting a single payer system, well, you know, we can take from those different countries and learn from them as well and apply, and apply it to a uniquely uh, U.S. system. So. Uh, that's, you know, the, the, it, there, there's a method uh, to uh, getting this done. And right now, you know, it is a, it is a, a perfect uh, a sort of meeting of the storms, if you will. You know, we have the pandemic. We have, all uh, you know, the, the statistics about people not getting care that they need. We have the statistics about uh, the system being inherently uh, 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 discriminatory. You know, we, so we have this opportunity, but we also have this opportunity to change things, right? We have a super, uh, Dem super majority in both houses to support AB 1400. Uh, the governor who campaigned on single payer, you know, the CNA endorsed the, the, the governor's um, uh, run for, for uh, Gavin Newsom's run for governor uh, because of this, you know, one of the, the important things was his single his stance on single payer. Uh, and right now we have a Democratic president and, uh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, Harold Javier Becerra, who's, uh, you know, who inevitably is the Health and Human Se Services Secretary to be, uh, he has also made public statements about single payer. It's a system that works, and we know it's a system that works and, and saves the population money. We are just up, and we're not, these, I don't, I don't usually view, and I'm saying this as a personal, uh, uh, from my own personal view, I don't see our government as the, the, the challenge. I see the money uh, in uh, in healthcare, the healthcare corporation, uh, corporate world as our uh, challenge. Uh, so really quickly, just more proof of why we need to change the system. Some of my brothers and sisters on the had already mentioned this about you know about people of color who are disproportionately impacted uh, from uh, the uh, from COVID and also who were set up to really um, suffer under the system in the, in, in, in the case of a pandemic because of what we, you know, we start off with. We're less likely to have uh, health insurance. We live in medically underserved, underserved uh, areas, uh, life, uh, lower life expectancies and health outcomes, you know, food deserts, you know, uh, in some cases, in some communities, you know, there are more liquor stores than there are uh, fresh food stores uh, in the communities. And again, you know, as I mentioned, the, uh, the inherent uh, racism in our system. Uh, again, with Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, we're seeing infections up to five times uh, compared to other uh, to um, uh, Caucasian folks. Uh, and again, you know, we are uh, BIPOC folks are concentrated at high risk health care and other essential jobs with the highest death rate. And I want to you know, shout out to my Filipino sister who presented earlier, Filipino uh, nurses who are 4% out of the uh, 4 percent of the nursing population, but about a third who already died from COVID uh, in uh, from um, uh, taking care of patients. 
Uh, so in, in saying that, I do want to uh, remind folks, you know, of where we're at with this, the infection rate, uh, you know, with 640,000 uh, uh, right, have already been infected. And also, uh, you know, we've had, uh, we've lost already, you know, almost 3,000 nurses as well. So this pandemic hasn't been slowing down for the people who, uh, who are most impacted and those who are caring for them. Oops, sorry. Uh, so what's happening right now, or what's happening after now that we have a bill? So we are gonna go into virtual legislative mode. We, if for those of you who were maybe on uh, on Thursday's call, uh, we, you know, we um, we had a statewide call to talk about uh, the, the uh, nurses' next steps in our campaign to uh, support CalCare, uh, AB 1400, which is, and right now we have an ambitious uh, uh, agenda to visit all 80 legislative uh, assembly districts. And so you, uh, we're looking folks to host and to participate. We also have online texting teams. Uh, we also have a California Movement Builder organizing trainings that are coming up to help folks to learn, to teach them more about talking to others about in, uh, about uh, the campaign, single payer, and getting folks, folks more involved. And I'm about to drop a bunch of links <laughs> after I'm uh, uh, finished talking here, folks. So hopefully you can copy and paste and I'll leave them also with our host to, to share with you all later. Uh, we have an interest meeting on Tuesday, uh, uh, Tuesday uh, March 9th for organizations who are interested in being formal supporters of, uh, of CalCare. Uh, we're uh, we're going to show folks how to do that and how to, uh, again, come on board and, and, and publicly make your, uh, declare your support for uh, AB 1400. Uh, so we're having a study council's resolution training on Thursday, March 11th. We're trying to get, we already have 10 cities in California who support Medicare for All. So we're really trying to up that number. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, and then we have a, uh, lots of educational events um, there have regarding uh, rural air in rural areas to talk about rural and focus on rural areas, racial justice unions, small businesses, and women's uh, uh, seniors and women as well. And uh, if you want more information, again, I'll you know get post some chat uh, post some links in the chat, and uh, you can always uh, visit us and uh, and e email us also at info at medicareforall.org. Uh, and so, right, I'm leaving you with, uh, it would, you know, the, the single most important thing that we can do right now, or the most, one of the most important things that we can do is to pass single payer health care. Now, this is all of our lives are, are depending on it, as well as those that we care about. And I would say the state of California, we are in a crisis in our health care system. And this is something that we sorely need. Uh, California leads the way. Uh, when, uh, when, with uh, cutting edge legislation, whatever happens in California, there go the rest of the, the nation. So we really need to, to set the tone, help everyone else in the U.S. get uh, single payer health care. So thanks for uh, all. I think that's all the time I have. And thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Mari. Um, sorry to have to have you squeeze so much information into so little time. Um, and uh, now um, um, we want to introduce uh, Ash Kalra, who is the California State Assembly member representing the 27th Assembly District, encompassing parts of Eastern San Jose. And Ash, along with Alex Lee and Miguel Santiago are co-authors of AB 1400, which would guarantee comprehensive high quality healthcare to all Californians as a human right. And as we know, all those Democrats being in power is not a guarantee. So uh, we're grateful for the, the Democrats who are stepping forward. Ash, you're on here. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's been great uh, to, to listen to all these incredible speakers. I wanna thank uh, the, the Single Payer Healthcare Coalition for inviting me. Uh, and Mari did a great job, I think, of going over the details of what we're talking about, AB 1400. At the end of the day, it's really like, you know, we're here because we, uh, we're, we're aware that truly accessible healthcare has been kept from our marginalized communities through so many ar hurdles, some arbitrary, some explicit, uh, like employment status or citizenship. Uh, and as I oftentimes say, the COVID-19 pandemic has not created inequities, it has exposed longstanding inequities in our society. Uh, and while the ACA was a positive step, you know, we still have millions of Californians that are uninsured and underinsured that don't have meaningful access. Uh, we have so many Californians going into medical debt 
because of unaffordable health care, having to rely on the charity of people through GoFundMe fundraisers, um, you know, where there's a new COVID related fundraiser made every two minutes. Affordable is relative to how much money you make. Universal is for us all and includes the most vulnerable members of our community. And that's why I introduced AB 1400. You heard a little bit about it right here. Uh, it makes it clear, no premiums, no co-pays no deductibles and, and would take the action to reduce the cost of prescription drugs as well as provide for things like dental and long-term care, uh, which currently aren't accounted for in our healthcare system. And so since Mari did a great job of talking about the details of the bill, I wanna talk more generally about the inequities in our society. You know, when, when we look at what COVID is doing uh, and others have alluded to this, uh, we're seeing uh, that communities of color uh, poor communities are suffering, even though it's those same communities that are working class essential workers. They're deemed essential all too often. They're treated as if they're sacrificial. They're the ones that are being forced to go to work without getting sick pay. You know, right now we're, we're, we're fighting to get more sick pay during the pandemic and the employers and the Chamber of Commerce is fighting us uh, on that. Even though so many of us, myself included, I'm at home, I'm working on a Zoom. I, there are others that are working, you know, in, in our restaurants. Cooks are the number one um, most likely to get COVID and die from COVID. Cooks, those are they're in our restaurants. They're in our fast food restaurants. You know, those that work to work uh, in, in service in our restaurants, our janitors, our farm workers, those that are our delivery drivers. You know, the same ones that Uber and Lyft say don't work for them and are robbing them of their money and livelihoods they're the ones that are getting COVID. And so one of the most startling facts that just came out recently, um, just, just a few days ago, is that the life expectancy has dropped. Now, since 2019 to 2020, June to June, just the first few months of the pandemic, black life expectancy has dropped 2.7 years in this nation. Latino life expectancy has dropped 1.9 years. That's in one year. Now, it's not just COVID related. It, when, when they say, well, Latinos and, and African Americans are more likely to get COVID, it's not just because that they're more likely to be essential workers. It's what they call, oh, well, they have more underlying conditions that lead them to have more severe symptoms. Well, why is it? You never see journalists ask that next question. You never see on CNN, they don't ask the next question. Why is it that they have those underlying conditions? that tend to lead to them getting not just COVID, they're more likely to get diabetes, they're more likely to get cancer. So why is that? It's because we have an unjust healthcare system. We have an unjust, just like, and, and let me say this, it's not just our healthcare system, our academic system, our economic system, our criminal justice system, environmental racism, every system in our society is, has racism systemically rooted in it. So when we talk about real estate, when we have people that fight against affordable housing, or they just want single family zoning, they don't want duplexes and fourplexes in the neighborhood, that's rooted in racism and longstanding racism in how not just redlining, but the allowance to have discrimination in, in, in our housing policy. So when we look at healthcare, let's remember, it's rooted in racist policies. It's rooted in policies that, that put the weight and burden on poor communities uh, working class, and, when I, and there's a difference of seeing, saying it's just low income zip codes and it's racist. Yes, do you see the combination of both? Absolutely. In fact, the three zip codes with the highest rates of, of COVID infections and deaths in the Bay Area are in my assembly district in East San Jose. So there's absolutely a, a cross section of race, a cross section of poverty. But even if you make everything else equal, One. you still see outcomes that are systemically racist. You still see that black import mentality is higher, even if you equal out um, you know, the income levels because we have these built-in biases in our system, both in terms of whether an insurance company says, yes, I'm gonna approve that, or no, I'm not gonna approve it, to how those that are actually in our system treat one another because we all have these inherent biases. So what we have to do is put in policies like single payer that won't get rid of racism. It doesn't get rid of all these biases, but what it does, it says that, hey, we all deserve quality healthcare. It doesn't matter 
whether you're a documented immigrant or not. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter if you're working your butt off, working three jobs and this whole fallacy of these side hustles and you're working 80 hours a week, making 40,000 a year, or you're a CEO that makes 4 million a year, that you both deserve the right to quality health care. You both deserve it. And that one does not inherently deserve more than the other. And how many of you, and I see a lot of people here that are very active in our affordable housing and, uh, and show a lot of love and care and try to support our unhoused community. How many in our unhoused community have you spoken to that became unhoused because of an underlying health issue, whether it was physical health or mental health, or a family member had a health issue. And because of that, the bills became overwhelming. They went bankrupt. They couldn't pay their rent. So it's all connected, right? And I will tell you this, you know, I, I'm getting right now folks coming at me from all directions saying, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? The first thing I say to that is, yes, single payer healthcare is costly. If you look at other nations that do it, they invest in their people. When you invest in your people, that costs money. But the outcomes actually bring a better quality of life and save money. Because if you're saying that the estimate is $400 billion a year, to pay for healthcare? Well, our current system in California costs $450 billion a year in order to support a profiteering healthcare industry. I'm not even gonna call it a healthcare system, it's an industry. $450 billion and not everyone's covered, not everyone has insurance, and many that have insurance, great, you have an insurance card. For a lot of people, that's like me having the business card of a Lamborghini salesman. Yeah, do I have access to Lamborghini? Absolutely. Am I gonna call that guy up to buy one? No, because I know my bank account doesn't allow for it. So if someone has a $6,000 deductible and then has co-pays and they're thinking about, wait a second, can I actually afford to go to the doctor or not? So they have, they have health insurance. One minute, Ash. Thank you, Ash. Thank you, uh, access to health care. So we know the obstacles are enormous because when you have an industry that is literally, literally making hundreds and hundreds of billions, through this pandemic, they're making billions. We've heard folks talk about the Women's Health Center at regional that they closed in the middle of a pandemic, the maternity ward in the middle of that, that's owned by HCA, notoriously a profiteering private hospital. Why are we letting them decide to, for us what kind of healthcare our community is gonna have access to? Why are we letting health insurance companies tell our doctors what they can or can't do when the doctor is the one that should be making that decision? I, and this is one thing I, I, I want our doctors and our nurses and those that are working in our hospitals as our assistants, physician's assistants, nurse assistants, as the janitors, as the techs, those working in the kitchens. I want them to get the money. I don't want it to go to someone profiteering off of our money. And let's remember, we're paying for the system right now that's dysfunctional and broken. So it absolutely is an Thank equity. You, uh, Dr. Yeah. King said for a reason that the greatest injustice is in health. Because if you don't have health, you can have equality in every other way. You can have access to the economy. You can have you know justice uh, in 10 different categories. If you don't have health, you can't exercise your right to freedom. You can't exercise your right to have equality under the law. And so thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for advocating. Thank you so much for being on the right side of history. It's not going to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy when it's something that means so much. So let's fight together. And I want to thank you all so much. Go to your city councils. Go to your Democratic Central Committee. We have a meeting this Thursday. Ask to put a resolution to support AB 1400. LA Democratic Party already did it. San Francisco is putting it on their, has already voted to, put, to have it uh, uh, you know, on their agenda. So let's make sure we do it everywhere. Let's make folks know this is a movement of love and justice for everyone in our community. Thank you. So oh, thank you so much, Ash. Um, that was uh, so such a lively and powerful presentation. Um, I wanna take a little a um, moment to figure out where we're at with time. Um, we advertise this as being from 2 to 3.30. We are at 3.30. Um, 
what we'd like to do now is uh, we're going to talk about a couple of upcoming actions from the single payer coalition. We want to have a word from uh, somebody from the uh, wage theft coalition a couple, for a couple of minutes. And then um, we want to have a brief um, a, some discussion about other possible actions. Um, and We'd like to have Q and A if we can. Now we're prepared to go um, maybe 15 minutes longer than our scheduled time. Uh, if you want to put your Q and A in the chat, you can. Uh, in the put your questions in the Q and A, you can. Um, right now, I'm going to start. I'm going to uh, cover uh, some of our upcoming actions. We are going to introduce a resolution at the city council to support single payer legislation on the state level, CalCare, and on the national level when it is introduced. We're gonna be doing this in early spring in a few weeks. We will need help to approach city council members and to attend a meeting when this is discussed. And if you'd like to get involved, please let us know in the chat and put your city council district if you know it. We may also be wanting to do phone banking and postcards. So any help that you can offer on this, we, uh, we will uh, accept gladly. The other thing that we are having is a honk and wave. This is street action. We love car rallies and honk and wave. They're so much fun. Um, it's Saturday, March 6th, a week from today from 12 to two. We're meeting on the corner of El Camino Real and Castro Street in Mountain View. And then um, we will break into small socially distanced groups on, to demonstrate on each corner of the intersection. Um, I did promise two, two minutes to Ruth Silver Taub of the Wage Theft Coalition. Uh, Ruth, are you here? Uh, hello, Ruth? Ruth. Um, does anybody know where Ruth is? Okay, well, um, let's see. Hello, okay. I am here, but I have put all the information in the chat so you can go on. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Ruth does uh, sterling work in the Wage Theft Coalition and she has some resources and information she wanted to share. Yeah, uh, I, sure. I guess yeah. I could um, just flag them. Um, I, I wanted to point out that the Wage Theft Coalition is part of the uh, Labor Standards Office and that we file public health complaints. And if anybody has any public health complaints, I, I can put the phone number in there. We also answer uh, any questions about uh, paid sick leave, any workplace problems you're having, any problems um, to do with health, we can make referrals as well. And uh, there's, there are really great resources to help you with that. And it's in English, there's, uh, it's free, there's lawyers available, uh, English, Spanish, Tagalog, Vietnamese, Punjabi, Hindi, and uh, Spanish. Uh, so uh, please take advantage of that as well. Um, there's also Bay Area Legal Aid that has a health resource center, even though th this is a terrible system. I'm Canadian and I am a great advocate. Uh, I have been all my life of single payer. Um, if you do need to navigate our horrible system, Bay Area Legal Aid has a great health resource, um, Andy Lee, who can help you navigate um, and, and do the best you can given this horrific system that we have. Um, and if you are interested in wage theft, we do have a meeting on Monday, uh, every, the first Monday of the month. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, so uh, one thing we'd like to do at this point is, um, talk about other actions that other groups may be planning along the lines of healthcare and uh, that haven't already been mentioned. And also um, if people would like to um, throw out some ideas 
about what we can do. Um, for instance, um, do we want to have a, an east side uh, car caravan? Uh, do we want to have uh, special webinars in Spanish and Vietnamese to talk about Medicare for all? Are there other ideas that people have? So if you have any suggestions like this, you can put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we will try and deal with them. So um, our chat monitors and Q&A monitors, what do we have going there? Yes, thank you, Peggy. We have a couple questions in Q&A. So one of them I'll read out loud. Uh, it's from Walter Hudson. How do we publicize the real costs of the current system so folks can see they are paying for insurance, not health care? Um, would anybody like to answer that? Um, maybe Madi or um, somebody else? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much, very much for, for the question. And, and thank you, Peggy, for the opportunity to respond. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, some of the information that I shared with you all uh, is, is a good way to, to do that. Also, you know, folks, this information is public. You can always Google, uh, you know, and uh, to get some of this, um, some of this information as well. A lot of this will be posted on our website. We are going to start, you know, we, we're actually upgrading now that we have AB 1400, we're upgrading our website to, um, uh, to basically reflect all of the new information that we have. So this will be made available, but you can always reach out to us and we can share some of the, the information with you, uh, just to let folks know, you know, we don't, uh, it's, we don't usually share uh, our slides with, uh, with in general, but if you reach out to us at info at medicareforall.org, we would be more than happy to, to send you information, cite resources, and uh, get you the, 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 uh, the statistics and data that you need to make your, make your case. I think the CEO of Sally's are most compelling. If for some of you might've heard, there was a woman who had, I think, I believe in California, who had a child prematurely, and she was saddled with a bill over eight hundred thousand dollars, and she was a nurse. So this, and she has, and she was insured. So uh, these are you know cases that people need to hear about because right now I think before we had the MFA movement, a lot of people thought they were suffering in silence, right? They, that they were the uh, alone. Uh, in the fact that they were paying these exorbitant um, uh, costs for their health care or they were getting these bills. And then as, again, the GoFundMe uh, uh, whole um, uh, information it came out that people were using GoFundMe to pay for the medical bills, I think more and more folks started to come out of the shadows and say, whoa, you got, I got a really uh, high bill, medical bill as well, and I have really good insurance uh, you know, there's a story after story that's up, that's out there publicly about people who had really good insurance but end up losing everything. So um, it's the information's out there. If you want to help putting it comp together pro comprehensively, we're we're certainly going to be, be um, very supportive of all of your efforts. So just reach out to us and and, and let us know how we may help. Okay, thank you. Um, what else, Miriam? There's also a question from Mimi. Uh, Biden just approved Medicare for all for Texas for their storm recovery. What are the odds that could happen here in California? I hadn't heard that myself. <laughs> he approved Medicare for all for Texas. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Anybody well, know anything about that? My guess is that it's probably like during the time of the emergency that for folks to buy into it for a short period of time, but I hadn't heard that. But I, I don't think it's like just a blanket Medicare for all for everyone. But I will say this, that there's a lot of steps that we have to take in order to get a single payer plan. That just, you know, the bill, this bill 1400 is one big step, but it's not by itself. If I could snap my fingers and have it you know, signed by the governor tomorrow, it doesn't mean by next week that anyone here would have health care. Because there are steps that we have to work with the federal government as well as within our state to determine how we can create the funding streams. The idea about AB 1400 is let's design the system because knowing what the system is like will help to inform the cost. The waiver is one of the federal issues that, that the Biden administration would have to support. It's a federal waiver to allow the federal funds that come in for Medicare and for other kinds of health care services, the uh, health care costs 
it'll allow us to use those funds to put it into a single payer fund. So that's the key, one of the, one of the key things that we're going to need from the federal administration. Again, that would not necessarily happen overnight, but there are groups right now calling on Governor Newsom to ask President Biden to at least start that first huge step in making the ask and start working with the administration to get that waiver. Our Attorney General Javier Becerra will very likely be the next cabinet secretary in the Department of uh, the Health and Human Services, which also plays a huge, huge role in allowing for that waiver as well. So we're not gonna get like, you know, the president's not gonna call us up and say, okay, you can do single payer now. It's quite the opposite. There's a lot of steps we have to take to get the federal administration to give us those allowances to allow this new type of program as a state. Okay, thank you. Is there anything that's come up in the chat? Um, there that... was a question in the chat, Peggy. Uh, there was one from Mimi as well, which is she wanted to know if they they wanted to know if the resolution uh, for Democratic, um, I believe, county clubs is available. So uh, you want they want a a copy of the resolution that we're going to send to City Council, the San Jose City Council. I believe it's the that... ones that were passed in county Democratic clubs. Oh, okay. Are those publicly available? Does anyone know? Um, I don't know. I do know that we will have a finalized version pretty soon of the resolution to the San Jose City Council. Mimi, you can go ahead and send us an email. I'll put our email in the chat once and it can help find that information for you. Yeah, we have some examples as well. Uh, so if folks want to just reach out to us at the info at medicareforall.org uh, email, we can help you get language as well. Okay, so um, I think um, unless there's anything else. There was another question. Okay. From George. Uh, George said, I'm particularly interested in the healthcare industry CEO compensation. Where can that information be found publicly? Um, I can, uh, that was from a Forbes study. So uh, we can, so you can um, look that up, but I'll also provide uh, either Peg, Greg, or Miriam the, the link for that and the slide itself if y'all are interested in seeing that. Okay. Those are all the questions I see right now, but please feel free to ask questions either in the Q&A box or in the chat. Oh, okay. it looks like there's a question from Bob. Bob, you can just go ahead and say that. Yeah, this oh. is a question for, for Ass. Uh, Ass, uh, a couple of speakers brought up today about the problem with lack of data. They have these aggregate data. We don't have the disaggregate. Can we do something at the state level, at the county level, to require this, to force this to happen on a regular basis? Thanks. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because whenever we try to disaggregate data, and, and this is particularly uh, relevant as was mentioned, the API community, because the API community is a really broad, uh, has really broad categories of what falls under it. Um, but but uh, we have faced, and not just in the healthcare, but in terms of disaggregating data across the board, it, oftentimes we face obstacles and, and usually it's the administrative cost of it. Now, what I will say is that when it comes to healthcare, it's a little bit different because you know that the uh, insurance companies and, and hospitals already are keeping extremely detailed information. Now, you know, we obviously the, the disaggregation wouldn't affect HIPAA because we're not asking for individual informa information. We're asking for disaggregation uh, you know, amongst different groups, age groups, ethnicities, race, what have you. Um, but yeah, I, I agree 100% and we'll continue. And I, I've been working over the last few years on issues regarding more transparency on healthcare costs. We've had a couple of bills over the last couple of years that the insurance companies have fought us on, but we've gotten uh, been able to get through um, in terms of a more detailed information as to how they justify increasing rates. Um, and, and disaggregation is a key part of what we need to do, but we we have, you know, we face opposition when we attempt to do that. But I'll, I'll I can certainly follow up as to what, if there are any efforts this year specific to disaggregation. Because as a follow-up, maybe these collection of grassroots groups could can help push that if, if we know how. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, mean, I think we want to say something. Yeah. Yes, I, I wanted to jump in. Uh, so uh, you know, there are there are some conversations starting right now about pushing for Santa Clara County to commit to disaggregation of all API data through all of its COVID nineteen dashboards. 
If you check out the public health department, they have a very detailed dashboard that covers uh, all information from deaths, COVID-19 infection rates, availability of beds and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the disaggregation that they did do was like a one-time thing and at the special request of county supervisors. Um, we're, starting the, we're starting discussions now around building up an effort to get the public health department to commit to disaggregation of data for all of its COVID-19 dashboards moving forward. Uh, so I posted, I dropped my email in the chat. If you're interested, please shoot me an email uh, mm -hmm. because this is something I think is critical for us at the local level. And of course, and of course we wanna appreciate Ash and all of the efforts done at the statewide level to do the same. Yeah, and, and the counties can really help because if Santa Clara County does, if LA does it, if San Francisco does it, then you build the momentum for state legislation. Okay, anything else here? Does, uh... So I, I just wanted to give uh, a little shout out to, first of all, I wanted to say that we had, including panelists and attendees, we had over a hundred people on today, which is like a huge success. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge the, the single payer folks that have been working on this very hard. Um, our Zoom master, Greg Miller, who um, in spite of his, uh, technical difficulties, did a stellar job in managing things. Joan Simon, who helped him out with that, and both of those have also done outreach. Joan Goddard, who's done outreach. Nassim, who's done outreach. Bob Jung and Miriam Ahmad, who were the uh, um, social media team and kept asking us for more and more information so that they could send it out. <laughs> Lucy Giver Conroy, our timekeeper. Um, Vicki uh, Mueller Olvera and Salem Atluni, who helped out with um, uh, media, and Jerry Hunt, um, who helped out with planning and with uh, monitoring the chat. So, thank you everybody so, so much. And I believe that this ends our session. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Unmute yourself and say goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.